All right, you guys, welcome back to the I Believe podcast. Um, per demand from some of our audience, we are bringing on, I'm hoping to be able to do this um, at least once a month, but we'll just see how it goes. I mean, I think it, it really depends on the people, but we're going to try to bring on um, a patient I who lost you. has um, been dealing with their diagnosis and just to talk about the general diagnosis of ocular melanoma, but we also want to talk about you know what it's like to be living with a METS diagnosis. Um, so. Kat is one of our first people to volunteer to be like, hey, like I will talk about this. We can talk about the roller coasters. We can talk about all the fresh things. Um, so uh, this is Katarina uh, McCray, and she is from Cookville, just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. She was diagnosed in April of 2021, last year. And um, I'm just going to let her briefly introduce herself and her family and just tell us a little about, about her. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Danae. I appreciate the nice welcome. Um, I, as she said, am in Cookville, Tennessee. Um, my family moved here 20 years ago, and we actually moved from Arizona. Um, I lived all over the West Coast previous to here, and we um, used to have a restaurant here in Cookville, and now I actually work for a for public supermarkets. It's a natural food grocery, not natural food grocery, excuse me. It's a grocery store here in Cookville, and I'm a baker. And um, we, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. No, it's okay. Um, so do you guys have, do you guys have kids? Um, have you, I mean, you mentioned you've lived back and forth. So how many kids do you yes. have now? We have two kids. Um, our daughter is 28 and our son is 23. Um, our daughter, Kiersey, she was born in Denver and our son was born in Tempe, Arizona. And... <laughs> Go to Tempe. <laughs> yeah. Love Tempe. Well, not Tempe. I live in Arizona, though. <laughs> yeah. Yes, love Arizona. Um, I, I actually grew up in Sedona and Cottonwood area. Um, so fun. It's a beautiful, beautiful it's, state. It's gorgeous up there. <clears throat> yes. Yes. So last year, as Danae was saying, I was diagnosed on April 1st um, with ocular melanoma. I went on the 30... 30th of March to um, the eye doctor I had been having like a film or a sheer curtain um, in my eye. I assumed I'm of the age that my readers were no longer going to work or I needed, you know, I had an infection or something was going on. And I went in and all they diagnosed me with at the optometrist's office was a detached retina and, you know, panic me like you have to get your eye fixed tomorrow morning so I went in the next day and they discovered that I had a tumor uh, my tumor was large it was um, 16 by 10 and a thickness of um, 10.4 I immediately was able to meet with the ocular oncologist and we set up for brachytherapy in May of 2021 on the 17th to put it in on the 21st to take it out everything was going really well I um, had that detached retina it was getting worse so the uh, doctor fixed that in September of 2021 and I went back and forth a couple times with uh, taking the oil out of my eye um, in March it was um, detaching a little bit so he lasered all of that um, let me back up in September he had um, repaired it by lasering not only the detachment but also lasering my tumor again um, <clears throat> my tumor at this point is stable um, it's luckily not growing I will have that um, rechecked here soon and everything's been going well. I've been feeling good. I've been trying to eat well. I've continued to work full time. Um, I am blind in that eye. Um, I was basically blind in that eye from the very beginning um, after surgery. And I now have a very large cataract that I will have to have removed as probably in November. Um, in July of this year, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to back up again. I hope no, you can fix okay. this. No, you're totally fine. <clears throat> um, so talk to us, I guess, a little before we go into July of this year. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little about, you know, after you got diagnosed, um, did you end up 
getting a biopsy done? Um, if so, like what kind of, what were the markers of that biopsy and what was your response? Yes, I did get a biopsy and I was diagnosed with um, class two prime positive. I have um, positive for GNAQ11 and BAP1. Um, of course, I was beyond shocked and did not know. I think I was numb to the whole thing. Um, it just, still to this day, I think it feels surreal uh, that this is what I'm dealing with. Um, I, I am at terms with it, but sometimes I wake up and I'm like, oh wait, I, I, I still can't see out of that eye. Um, it's kind of over one of those, like, okay, you accept it, but like, okay, it's still a sucky, sucky thing to be reminded of every morning. Exactly. Because I'll sleep and I'll be like, oh, I feel completely fine. And then you wake up and, and I'm not. It's like, oh, slam, reality. Yes. <laughs> reality is back. Um, yes. So you found out the class two um, diagnosis as far as your biopsy results went. Did you end up deciding to do any kind of the, the adjuvant clinical trials that sometimes are available to class two patients? Um, and if so, like what was your decision making process? Why did you decide to do it? Yes, I did do that, Danae. I decided, I had heard um, through the online support groups about Dr. Sato and a Sutinant trial. And so I inquired with his office and there was actually a Sutinant trial and VPA. Um, and my thinking was, initially I, I thought, I don't need to be doing that. I don't need to be putting anything chemical or whatever into my body, just stay strong and all of those things. But then in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, there isn't anything I can do. I need something that I can do that possibly will help me and hopefully educate and help other people in the future. That was my whole goal when I started doing the trial um, was, yes, I wanted it to work for me, but I also wanted them to learn and hopefully it would help others. And yeah, for sure. hopefully it still will. Yep. I <clears throat> so as you did that clinical trial, um, did you like, did you feel like that was, I mean, what did, what did that look like for you? I guess let's just kind of like give a picture of what that can look like because obviously it was based out of Philadelphia. You're in Cookville, um, Nashville area, Tennessee. So, um, did you have to travel every time, every, you know, every few months? How did it, how did the clinical trial look? Um, and I guess, <clears throat> yeah, let's just start there. Yes, it was actually kind of tough. And because I am in Cookville, it's a two hour flight. I had to fly up every three months um, to get the medication, to meet with the team. They did some tests up there. Um, I was luckily able to do uh, my scans that is required for the trial. But I was also, um, once I was diagnosed uh, with ocular melanoma, I met with a medical oncologist and my protocol for scans is had from the very beginning was every three months. Mm -hmm. And I continued doing that here in Tennessee. And then the extra scans that Dr. Sato's team needed, I uh, was able to add those on and they would read the scans up there as well as my oncologist team here. Okay. And go ahead. No, you're good. Um, so you had just basically regular <coughs> scans. You had blood work every three work every three months. And then um, I'm trying to remember what was there was there was like a cardiac test you had to have monitoring for right for the yes the echocardiogram mm -hmm. and, that and that was, was just every part of three the clinical months. trial correct they um, wanted to monitor that your valves and everything and the muscles in your heart were working properly and they did an EKG when um, I was up in Philadelphia for my meetings every three months and then during the trial um, I did blood work every two weeks. Oh, no, um, I forgot. And I was every two weeks. <laughs> yeah. How, how we forget. So much. Yeah. And I was able to do that luckily here at home. So for me, you know, having to go every three months was difficult, but if I also had to go and then stay for an extended period of time just to do all the imaging and, and all of those things, it, 
that would have made it so much more difficult. Um, I was willing to do it though. If that's where I could get hope in the best possibility, I was willing to do it. And no, I mean, I mean, like you said, like it makes sense. Um, and so let's fast, let's fast forward a little bit. Um, I know over the summer, like, cause I did that clinical trial as well myself. Um, mm -hmm. so over the summer you had your routine monitoring at this point, had you finished the clinical trial or were you still finishing the medication for the trial? I was still on the medication. Um, and I had my scans, um, in April and all along in my scans, I should let you know, I had two spots in my liver. Uh, one, I'd had a spot from years ago that had been there, um, and it was only picked up when I had a kidney stone. And so it had been no years. change yeah. in that from 2018 until May, or until, excuse me, July of this year. And everything was still stable. There were still those two spots in my liver, no changes. I went in for my three month scans in July, July 27th. And I found out that day that I had metastasized to my liver. And so that one was the largest. And then the other one um, wasn't far behind. And there's approximately 20 to 30 more uh, little tumors. So basically the two spots that you had initially for multiple years that were considered mm -hmm. stable for so long because they weren't changing, everything looked good, they kind of just went on overdrive and, and said, hey, let's make babies. <laughs> and exactly. they just went everywhere. Yeah. Um, we so, tease that it's, you know, mama and daddy and they decided to have a family. <laughs> yes, and they set up camp in your liver and we really don't want them to be there. No. No, when um, we saw Dr. Sato um, and we saw the scans with him and looked at them, my husband said I looked like it, um, Dalmatians, the spots on a Dalmatian. And I thought, well, that's a good analogy, but not really when you <laughs> want to get you hope for. <laughs> no, yeah. and, it's, and it's so tricky, though, because like you said, you'd gone from stable for so long and yes. thinking that, okay, these, these spots are probably not cancerous because they're not changing. They haven't been changing for so long. Um, Correct. To, to then, you know, you light up like a Christmas tree, so to speak, on the mm -hmm. scans, and they're like, yeah, actually, those two spots are cancerous. Um, so what was kind of, what was the process um, after you got this initial scan report um, what, what did you decide and your medical team of oncologists decide to do from there? Yeah. Um, so I found out the results with my medical oncologists, um, here in Nashville and she laid out the different options, um, uh, because it is only in my liver. Um, it was highly recommended to do liver directed therapy. Um, her office does not do those down here. Um, Dr. Sato's office is where I needed to go. So I am with Dr. Sato and his team and they chose and I agreed upon doing chemo embolization. Um, it is a clinical trial um, because the, the chemo drug that they're using is 300 milligrams. So it's a higher dosage. Um, and the reason for that, uh, my understanding is the fact that I have so many in my liver, they want to just really basically blast my liver. And um, if it was anywhere else in my body, that may not be the course of action for me. Uh, but so, um, <clears throat> well, sorry to interrupt, but that's um, okay. I just was going to ask. So when, when they, did the initial like kind of process, um, did you end up having to have a biopsy done of the tumors in the liver? And if so, do you know which, like which tumors they focused on or did they take samples mm -hmm. of as many places as they could? They only took samples of the largest one okay. and they, um, luckily, luckily for me, a lot of people, they go through the ribs, but for me, they went under my rib, um, because the tumor was, um, they were able to get it at that location. 
Um, I could be mistaken, maybe they did the two biggest tumors, but um, all the other little ones were too little. They, they wouldn't have been able to biopsy those, so they just did the biggest tumor, and um, it did, of course, come back confirming the METs, um, and from July, it went from around one centimeter to August, when I had um, a treatment at the end of August, to 2.2 centimeters. So it had grown, but it wasn't this enormous I, you know, amount, like I've heard other people, it goes from one to 10. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and thankfully, I mean, if it's gonna grow at all, like it, it appears that it's been slower growing for a longer time, because it's obviously, it showed up a long time ago and then and then now it only started growing this year. Um, right. I just was curious, like, if they were able to confirm that it was those two initial spots that had shown up, you know, years ago that were confirmed to be uveal melanoma. Um, I believe that they are, and and so as the team does as well, I think from my ocular oncologist, he said that the tumor in my eye had been there for years, and... Um, I know that I've had this, when I take photos, I've always told my family, I'm like, what has happened to my eyes in photos? Because they just, I look weird in photos. Mm -hmm. And I, from another gentleman that um, had been in the group, he had said he had gone back. Um, he used to say that about his eyes. He goes, my eyes just look weird. So he started looking back at photos of himself and I did the same thing. And I could almost pinpoint it to when my eyes changed. And I, it just, there was no feedback from my eye. Like the, it just stared basically. Yeah, it just wasn't really like. No reaction. I don't know, like it, it didn't really look as alive maybe as, as right. the other one. Right, right. So my belief is, and whether this to be true or not, but this is where my belief is that tumor that was found when I had that kidney stone in 2018 was probably already a METS, but it just hadn't done anything. And mm -hmm. the tumor could have been there that whole time in my eye. Oh my I, it just wasn't diagnosed. Yeah, and it's so crazy. Like, it's absolutely crazy to think um, just really, I mean, if we're, I guess if we really do the math, like you've been living with Mets, even though you didn't know it, you've been living with Mets for what, over four years? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, so <laughs> congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> you made it so long without any treatment because you had no idea what was going on. I mean, I don't know. I guess I feel like that's, that's just something to, to like, think be about. thankful. Like, okay. Like, wow. I didn't right. know that I had it, but like it was there and it could have done more damage than it did. And it didn't. And right. So like, thank goodness that it didn't. Um, right. And I mean, and it's possible that maybe it really wasn't, and it was this vascular cells and, and all of that. And but, maybe then it went away and then it came back. Who knows? Like, it's, right. it's, it's just so bizarre. All of a sudden something changed in it and it decided to grow. Yeah. You know, that's so the weird thing. It is. And it's so weird. And it's, and I know like just from, from our perspective, like within, you know, in our, our group of the people from the cohort who were on this, this VPA student trial with mm -hmm. Dr. Sato, I know we just kind of spent most of the summer like just being floored like by one person after another like you and yes. one other girl and then another girl and, yes and it just kind of kind of hit hard um and we i think we all had talked about this right like throughout throughout the last couple of years um maybe a year and a half like so we've we've talked about it at different times where you know someone else in the community we see someone got diagnosed or we have a friend who we know who maybe they're not in the trial but they did get diagnosed with metastatic disease and and we all kind of would rally around each other and like, okay, like this is so hard. It's so hard to see someone go through this. Mm -hmm. And um, what's, I guess, what's it been like for you on the other side of that to be actually going through it and to have people maybe like me or like other people in our cohort who like we were trying, we're trying so hard like to be there for you, but like obviously we know like there's, there's nothing we can say to make this better. Yeah, and, and I appreciate just the support and, and learning from other people, it, there's so much out there treatment-wise that 
I feel like there's a lot of options. I, I feel that more and more. So it's like, okay, so I'm going to have um, scans at the middle of October, and then I'll go meet with the team and I'll find out if this is working. And I know this might sound strange, but I don't really feel nervous at this point. I'm like, okay, I want to know if it's working because if this isn't working, let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. Um, I do qualify for Tebby. Um, Tebby is ty typically used if it's sy sy systemically, and that's if it's anywhere else um, so in your body. Would, let's just clarify that just for anyone who's not, not clear. Um, so systemically meaning like it's in the liver, but maybe it's also in the lungs. It's maybe in the bones. It could be in the brain. I mean, right. who knows where else this thing could go. Right. Um, but so the, the reasoning then is that because it's only in your liver, I'm just trying to recap, because it's yes. only in your liver, the team felt it was best to focus on liver directed therapies first. And since Tebby is a systemic whole body therapy, they didn't want to just do that because right. traditionally whole body therapies don't tend to do well with isolating the liver. Correct. And okay. it's with it, um, if they can stop it is the way I look at it. Okay, let's just stop it in the liver so it doesn't go any farther. Um, I, I do want to say that um, I had a brain scan and it's not in my brain, but I do have a spot we're monitoring on um, my skull, so on the bone. Um, I'll have that rechecked coming up, but at this point that isn't 100% been diagnosed as METS. It's likely, but they're, they're not going to confirm that until the next round of brain scans. Okay. Uh, so are those also going to be coming up in October for you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, it um, should hopefully coincide with the other one. No, that makes sense. Um, so. I mean, I know this has been just just from observing and just as you know, as one of your friends, like I've seen the emotional roller coaster that this has been. Um, but let's mm -hmm. just touch for a couple minutes on, you know, what what was what was some of the first things that came to mind? You know, when you first found out that day that your scans had come back and they're like, oh wow, like there's a lot here. Um, yeah, there's a lot of metastatic disease. We're obviously we still need to confirm it, but like there's a lot of things going on here. Um, yeah, what was your initial like thinking process of all of this? My first thought was when I was told um, it was in my liver, and then I it was like 20 to 30 spots. I was like, what? Three months ago I had two, and now I have 30? How? How is that even possible? And then it was just the shock, and then what are we going to do? How? How can we stop this? And I feel like nothing is fast enough. It's like, no, we can't do treatments like tomorrow. with chemoembolization, <laughs> like tomorrow, or like, you know, do the right liver or the right lobe one time and then wait four weeks and do the left. And it's like, well, I don't want to wait. Let's just do the left. And all of those things were difficult. And, and trying to learn what else is out there and figuring out what why is this better than the other? I went back and forth on the, the um, teb, doing Tebby versus chemoembolization. I'm like, well, if I'm HLA positive, then let's just do that. But when it was explained to me, it's only in your liver, and we want to focus on that because it will, once you do systemically, you might not qualify for certain trials. Mm -hmm. And we want to leave options open basically um, not leave well, and, that for so last but it's just very to clarify toxic. to clarify though because tebby and kimtrak has been approved fda approved it is no mm -hmm. longer in trial so right you don't have to qualify for a trial and have not done a previous treatment that could just be used at any point in your treatment plan right um, as long as obviously you are hla positive which you are um, hla 0201 positive i believe yes and so as long as that that's a, that's always going to be accessible as long as you're you know here in the United States, which you are, um, and that so that I think that's just helpful to explain. It's just the idea that it's it's not so much that this couldn't help you, it, like it may, but like you mentioned, you touched on this just briefly, but it it's a little more toxic. Um, it could be a little mm -hmm. harder on your body, and most of your tumors are in your liver, so the focus needs to be on the liver. Um, right is kind of what the the care team seems to have 
kind of rallied around. Right. Um, and and like I fully said, trust this team. I, I really, I mean, this is Dr. Sato's forte and his team. Um, and I feel really good about, you know, working with them and, and doing yeah. this. Well, and I think that's so important, like to be able to feel like you have a good medical team um, and that they're working together as a team. So you picked the chemo embolization. Tebby's kind of on the, on the option of we'll use this if and when we need it. Right. Um, and then um, obviously, like you said, like other clinical trials could be in the running if you needed them, but that's all based on how these scans go as they go. Um, every, mm -hmm. Do you have scans every three months still or is it, is it every two? Um, now they're going to be every two months. Um, and do they include, um, they do the, the liver MRI, and I know you mentioned the brain MRI is going to be happening. Um, do they also do CT scans or like anything full body? I guess I'm just kind of yeah. curious what this looks the like. The CT of the chest and CT of the pelvis, and I'm not certain that they will do the brain scan every two months. Um, I think that's probably not going to be as often. Um, that's to be discussed further right now. Um, we're just focusing on my liver and making sure that that is, that we're doing what we can to shrink those tumors. Um, I do have blood work every week um, that checks, every, you know, all my liver enzymes and, and they follow very closely with those numbers. <clears throat> and okay, I lost myself again. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so you're doing lots of different, you know, blood work, um, lots of different tests and things that people are, you know, your, your medical team is monitoring. Um, so you mentioned, I can't remember exactly when you mentioned it, but you mentioned a little bit of how, you know, that, that your general attitude is like, okay, like shock, disbelief. Um, obviously there've been lots of big emotions because of various different reasons, um, but that you've kind of landed in this place of like, okay, like I'm not so much nervous. I just want to. I just want to know. I want to have some answers and know what what what's my next step. Right. Um, I want to so know the you, results of the scans. Yeah, like you want to know. You, know? you want to know if what you did is working. Um, and so, do you feel like maybe um, getting those answers and then having having the options laid out and being able to select, you know, what are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like that's, that's maybe helping you cope is kind of like just staying focused on, okay, if this doesn't work, I'm going to try next, like plan B, plan C. Right. You know, let's discuss it. Let's see what the next option is. Um, I think at initial diagnosis of METS, um, I should say, and, and I've probably expressed this, um, on social media, um, is the fear of the unknown because I think that's been my biggest um, obstacle, not having full understanding, not full clarity of any kind to the treatments and how I'm going to feel with the treatments. Uh, you know, when I went for my initial treatment, you know, I didn't know what I was going to feel. And I, luckily I handled it for the most part okay. I had um, nausea. Um, for quite a while. I've had some pain. Um, I'm about four weeks out from that first treatment. I'm getting ready to go this Tuesday for my second. And I feel like this one is going to really let me know how I'm going to do going forward um, with this treatment plan. Um, there are people I've heard that have done chemoembolization for years. They they do it for like four treatments and then they take a break for a few months and then they, you know, they're still getting monitored and making sure the tumors are stable and, and or shrinking. Um, so I feel like now that I've learned that from other people and from other research I've done, that fear of the unknown has subsided somewhat. I, I, I feel more like I'm in this attack mode now. I'm ready to just face it head on and just deal with what's being given to me as best I can. Um, that's not saying I don't have fears still. Um, I know when I get up there on Tuesday and go for treatment, I'm going to be nervous and not want to have nausea or any 
kind of pains or whatever. Um, but now I better know what I what to expect. Yeah, for I, sure. Well, and it's it's interesting. I think the way that our brains kind of absorb information like this, right? Like these kinds of circumstances and and the trauma that they are, right? That that it's such a traumatic thing to, you know, to get a cancer diagnosis to begin with, let alone mm-hmm. have it progress and have it come back, right? Um, but it's interesting that I think it's I think it's kind of a common thread through most of us is that we tend to grasp for certainty because the unknown is so hard. Mm-hmm. And and it's kind of like like you said before, like the unknown doesn't really go away. Like there still are unknowns. There's still so many unknowns. But I just, I think that it's super empowering to notice that like almost across the board, every patient that continues, you know, mentally and, and, and emotionally, um, coping, so to speak, and just being able to like survive through this and not have it be something, um, that they're totally crippled by 100% of the time. Right. Uh, I think that the reason maybe behind that, and, and you can tell me if you disagree, but I, I, my theory is that the reason is that it's because we find the things that we can be certain about. We find the things that we can control. Um, we find, you know, just they're little things. Like they're not, they're not, they're they're not going to maybe be deal breakers in in this whole metastatic diagnosis or in the cancer world in the in the in, to begin with. But they are going to be helpful in just managing the day to day. Right. And I think I think too, like just like you said, like learning from other people and hearing other people's stories. I think it it can feel so much and like when we're initially diagnosed, it can feel so much like we're the only one. And then you hear other people and you hear other stories and you hear of people who are, you know, doing well, three, five, you know, just just at the initial diagnosis, before we know anything much about the whole metastatic spread and possibility of that and, and the likelihood. Just have brachytherapy, have your eye enucleated, whatever goes on there, and then you're like panicking because you're being told it could spread but you don't know when. And right. we hear of the stories of people 10, 15 years, and it's like, okay, maybe that's I'll be me. Okay. <laughs> that's right? one like, I want. Yeah, yeah, like I want that. And so, the, but we focus on that, and we, I think, we find just some peace with, like, okay, it doesn't have to be quite as uncertain as I thought. Maybe, it, maybe it could turn out to be okay. Um, and then, you know, something shifts. Obviously, like something shifted for you. This changed, and it's no longer just your eye. Now you're dealing with the metastatic disease to your liver. But now you found other stories to latch on to. You found other people whose experiences you can learn from, who you can kind of just glean some hope from of like, okay, this could just, it could just work for me. Um, and just kind of dwelling on that possibility, I think, is, I mean, we could argue it, it's a form of faith. Like, it's just a form of having faith in the mm-hmm. future despite so much unknown. Right. I think that when I learn from other people and I, you know, I they, I've had people reach out to me, and and I will. I'm better at supporting, I think, other people than I am almost supporting myself. And then I, as I'm saying things that I to them, then I'll turn around. And I'll be like, wait a minute, I need to listen to that myself. And I, I hope that I have many years. I mean, one of the other shockers I had was that it was only 15 months after and I kept I had it in my head okay maybe you know three years I mean I I hate to say it but with all of my mutations and classification and praying positive and all of those things I didn't dwell on it but I, I believe that I was very likely going to metastasize and then when I did it was like I was shocked that I did, but I was also not surprised. And then yeah, I was like, like this weird dual, like, I'm not surprised, but I am surprised. Like, like this soon? I mean, that yeah. that was the thing. This soon? It's, it's not supposed to happen right now. Um, mm. And it makes you start putting your priorities. I notice, you know, I, I do think working still helps me. I, I definitely tire so much easier. Um, I'm not feeling as strong, um, which... Hopefully I can do that, but by the time I get home, I'm ready to just take a nap, and uh, so it's hard to exercise. But I, well, I'm, and I mean, it's it's tricky too because this, I mean, treatment aside, just just the emotional and the mental weight 
that this this new phase of your diagnosis carries is enough to just exhaust anyone. Right. Um, and I, I think that just like with the initial diagnosis with the eye, it gets better with time. And yes. it, like it can, it can get better with time. I don't, maybe it doesn't for everybody, but I think it can. Um, just as you kind of get more in the groove of, of what the treatment feels like, your body gets more used to it, but also just that you emotionally and mentally and physically get, get better at carrying the weight of this. Yeah. Um, it's getting into and, that routine and, yeah. and like, okay, this is what I did with my eye. So now, you know, for the longest time, I don't think I ever accepted that it was cancer. I, I think I just was in some sort of denial for months and months and months. And then, you know, being in the VPA and Sutinant trial, it was like, okay, this was my routine. So I switched, you know, my routines and now this is what I'm doing. And we'll see where this one's going to lead. And hopefully I'll just keep being driven to the right people. Um, I feel very lucky getting the ocular oncologist I, I received, uh, the medical oncologist I received, both very, very familiar with ocular melanoma, I, which is unheard of for a lot of people, and, and that saddens me because it, it shouldn't be like that. I, I also believe now that all optometrists need to have more education on ocular melanoma. I. I don't understand that one at all. Or this is kind of a random, random question, but have you always had glasses, like, and had regular eye exams? Um, no. In fact, my left lens—that's um, my blind eye—is um, just a weighted lens. Um, on the right, I've been wearing readers for probably about five, six years, okay. and um, actually now when I drive, I take these glasses off. Um, it's easier for me to drive without the glasses, and I but I wear them all the time now. Uh, my ocular oncologist was very firm with me about protecting my eye, and I have to say it's been I good on this one. I you should you probably can't see it, but I have scratches on this eye where at work I've ran into things, and mm -hmm. I've been lucky that I I have my eye covered. Um, yeah. I know he wants to protect the right side, but it's... <laughs> it still helps to protect the left. <laughs> it actually really has helped this one. Uh, but I, when I'm at home, a lot of times I'll just not keep them on. But if I need to read anything and I can't see, um, like, up close some things, it I still have difficulty seeing with just the one eye. No, for sure. You know. Okay. No, I was just curious. Like I, mm -hmm. I, um, I think it's always interesting. Like I'm someone who's had eye exams my entire life, like since I was eight. Right. And I got diagnosed 20 years after my initial first eye exam. So like I had yearly eye exams and I mean, like you said, like just the education piece for optometrists, like yes, that if an optometrist who you see for contacts or glasses is the most commonly seen person that you see in the eye doctor world, they do need to be more aware of this. Yes. Um, and, and that education piece, it's like, it's so tricky because it, I guess to me, it, it kind of seems like at least around where I live, a lot of the optometrists, the um, ophthalmologists tend to be kind of a little more like doing their own thing. Like they're kind of mm -hmm. private practice. They just do their own thing. They do their own thing a certain way. And I know that there are different movements and different medical communities that are trying to bring people together. Um, like the, um, just to try to bring together the whole ophthalmology and all of the optometry mm -hmm. people and, and give them opportunities to learn together. But the unfortunate thing is I think it will just keep taking a little more time, like for that collaboration piece to really become right. more um, commonplace and that it's not so everyone is so separated and no, I'm the expert. No, I'm the expert. It's like, no, just learn from each other. Exactly. That you're not the expert because just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you're an expert. Right. Um, that's you a whole other like, topic. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole other topic. But like, seriously, like just the idea of, of being able to continue to learn whether you have completed schooling or not is such an important thing. Um, yes. And to, to keep learning about things that are rare because it's the things that are rare that make the biggest difference in, in like people like you, your and your and my life. Um, just that awareness and that knowledge, you know, who knows, like it, it could have helped. And hopefully now that our doctors know more, maybe they will be able to catch it sooner for someone else. That's my, that's my only, my only hope with my situation because 
It, right. It was, I mean, I saw a doctor every year and I still didn't, like, it still didn't get found because of the location, because of the limited technology. So like, there's just so many things that can change in technology in the ways that eye exams are done. There's so many things that can be improved upon. And I hope right. that, you know, you and me, like, I, I guess I just hope that stories like us is reasons that they improve. Um, right. The eye doctor I saw, it was the first time I had seen him, and I thought, okay, he sent me super fast to go get my eye fixed the next day, and I thought, he had to have seen this tumor. I mean, mine is more towards the front, and it's like, mm -hmm. you know, there's no way he didn't see it. He was just being nice. He, you know, he didn't want me to get freaked out overnight, you know, and let them tell tell me. And I did. I went back to him, and I... I went there intentionally to thank him for not saying anything ahead of time. And he's like, what are you talking about? He did, He had no idea what ocular melanoma was. Yeah, like he just, he literally just saw a detached retina. Right. He saw nothing else. And my uh, melanoma is in the ciliary body and in the choroidal. Okay. And it, it Which just... Which is kind of a double whammy, isn't it? Like that's yes. Kind of like a double, like a ciliary body... Ocular melanoma tends to be, as far as I've read, I think that, that it tends to be a little more aggressive Correct. than like choroidal melanoma can go either way. You can have the 50-50 chance um, really that it will or it will not metastasize, but right. choroidal tends to have that, that big window of people that tend to be okay and the people that tend to not be okay. Right. Um, but ciliary body has a much larger percentage of people who do metastasize. Right. Um, which See, I, I was just, you know, positive on all those things, so... There's so many, so yeah. many markers, but it's, it's absolutely, I think it's just crazy that you have both. Um, yeah, it, I think so too. And I think uh, my ocular oncologist, he, I think he's seen a lot, but I think he was also surprised um, with yeah. it because it, that's what caused my detached retina or, you know, so he asked me, he goes, well, didn't your optometrist see this? And I said, no. And he goes, what? <laughs> he was shocked. <laughs> it's like, and, did he not like? It, yeah, it's, yeah. it's interesting how that works. Yes. Um, my, my optometrist basically told me her technology wasn't high depth. It wasn't high depth enough of a camera. Like it didn't have as good of a, uh, what's the name? I can't think of the name for it. See, it happens to me too. It's okay. <laughs> um, no, it just wasn't as high, t as high, as high definition, high tech of a picture. Right. Thing. Right. So all she saw was just a big dark spot. She just thought like, okay, that, that's a classic detached retina. And so she sent me in, but the further imaging, the ultrasound, all of the mm -hmm. extra in-depth tests, like those are the things that reveal like, oh no, this is like cancerous. Um, right. But she was also surprised. She, she spent the entire time thinking she had sent me to go get a detached retina fix and that I was going to be fine. Um, I think it's interesting though, if she'd been following you for years and years that she didn't look back on previous pictures or scans and say, well, that's, you I mean, didn't that's a have this to before. Ask. Like, Hey, like, can we look back? Can we see any of those? Did I have any digital scans we could compare to or any notes of anything? Right. Um, and you have but, to advocate I mean, those things for yourself yeah. because no, for sure. I'm big on speaking up in the doctor's office and, and saying, wait, this doesn't make sense. I, I like to think uh, I have, enough medical knowledge. I may not know all the terms and I may be very layman in, in the way I, I speak about it, but I, I have enough knowledge that I can ask the questions that are going to give me the answers or have them research into, wait a minute, that is a good question. Let me look into yeah. that. Let me find out for you because like with your doctor, she, unless you and literally say, I want you to go look at my previous scans. And I'm sure at the time you didn't think to do that. Well, of and course. I mean, just, just like for my knowledge, I don't know that I ever had a retina scan done. Okay. Just because just because I just was always like, no, like I don't need to pay the extra 30 bucks. Now I tell everyone pay the extra 30 bucks. Yes. <laughs> like, but even, even with that, there still is because of the window of, of location, Right. There's just still so many things that just because of the limits of technology, it still may not have been found. Right. And, and I think at the end of the day, I think, who was it, Dr. Murray that I was talking to, he mentioned something like, you know, we can fret and hope and worry about it all, all, that, we, all that we want. It mm -hmm. won't change anything for us. I think the only good thing that it can do is change something for someone else. Right. Um, 
but that it doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything for me. Mine was found when it was found. Right. Um, Same. And, and like, I think about my kids, Mm -hmm. you know, so have your kids, um, have they changed like the, the routine of what they do and how they approach obviously their eye care and, um, just those kinds of things, just kind of out of curiosity. I know you have adult Mm -hmm. kids. I have little kids. So like I have a little more control (laughs) over like what they do. (laughs) Well, we're struggling because my doc daughter went, she lives in Atlanta and she went to an eye office down there and they absolutely refused to dilate her eyes and they would not, everything I told her that she needed to have done, um, the photos, everything, they, they refused. They said, there's no reason to dilate your eyes. We have this special camera. It gets behind the eye, blah, blah, blah. And they need to listen to uh, Dr. Murray, Dr. Murray's episode. <laughs> yeah, and so now I I want to find, I want her to find somebody, and I'm not even really sure. It's like, okay, just go to an ocular doctor, you know, an ocular oncologist, just based well, on my diagnosis. Like in that area, I, I would imagine that there should be someone in that area who would yeah. see her just based on family history. And um, I, I would like to find to that. Looking. You know, I'd hate it because, you know, We've thought about having both our kids tested or, you know, for BAP1 um, because that can come from one of the parents. And at the same time, I, I don't know if I would want to know it myself, but our son, we are in Cookville. It's a decent sized community, but it's not large. And that was one thing I was going to talk to. Um, my ocular oncologist is Dr. Reichstein. Um, in Nashville, and I was going to ask him, would you just look at my son's eyes? Would you just do a thorough exam on his eyes? Um, uh, My daughter has, both my kids are fair skinned. She has blue eyes. He has green eyes. He's more like me Mm -hmm. than, you know, family. Well, and it's, like you said, like, it's, it's just one of those things you want, you want to know, but you don't want to know. Right. (laughs) Um, But, uh, you know, as a mom, like you just, you want, you want them to have as many of the answers ahead of time as they can. Right. Like if they are going to have to deal with this diagnosis, then hopefully it's found sooner because you're more aware of it because of your own, your own situation. Um, right. But you know, with any luck, they won't be part of that six in a million group of people. <laughs> Maybe it'll just, it'll just be fine. Yeah. Um, I just want them to get a baseline and then just yeah, be exactly. checked every year properly. Well, and like you said, that can be, that can be tricky to, um, that can be tricky to get like doctors on board and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, so I wanted to just kind of, as we wrap up here, um, I wanted to just end with maybe just what would you say to someone who's newly diagnosed with METS about like, you know, how do you just, how do you cope with this on a day to day basis? Cause I know you, you've mentioned to me before that like, it's always there. Um, but how, how do you make it, you know, through the day? Is it like hour by hour, day by day, like all of these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Now, I just try to keep my focus on moving forward and I, you know, like I said, you know, I'll get pains every now and then I'm like, Oh, is it doing something? Then it's like, Nope, we're not going there. It's like, I take myself out of it. And I, I think people newly diagnose, if you can just look at the fact that there's many treatment options, And there's more doctors out there for us that can give us options, give us hope, and just believe that there is something that's going to work for you. Um, What works for me might not work on the next person. Everybody's different. Um, I could do this chemoembolization and it works for me, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for the next person. Um, I just try when I get down, I, I allow myself to be down. I allow myself to own my feelings and my worries and my concerns. I, I do find that I tend to not put up with as much BS from people. Um, life is just too short and there, you just have to do the things you enjoy and focus on making sure those things happen. You know, get outside. I mean, for me, being outside is huge. I, I just, it's very rejuvenating. Um, I have pets, so I 
spend a lot of time with my pets. Um, I have a really big Antolian Shepherd and he's attached to me. I mean, I know he knows something's not right and he can tell before I can tell that I'm not feeling good. And he's right there and as soon as he's there, I, I feel better. So I focus on the things that are making me feel loved and um, I hate to use this word because, but the word wanted, you know, that. Well, yeah, I, just that, that people want you here. And people, I want to be And your here. animals and you want to be here. Um, yeah. And I know, um, I don't, I don't know that I've talked about this at all. Probably not on the podcast. I know we've talked about it like in our group and stuff, but, um, but I think it's, it's kind of this, this point of healthy. I, I think it's healthy denial where you are like hopeful, like to the point that it's, it's almost rebellious against the mm-hmm. odds kind of a thing. Yes. And, and like we, I know we, we kind of, I, I call it like just rebellious hope. Like it's literally just hope in with a little healthy dose of denial, I think is probably really what it is. <laughs> but I think that's idea, true. Like, okay. Like I'm going to hope for this. Like I, there's nothing, like no one can take that from me. Right. And no one can take that desire to, to be here in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. No one can take that desire away from right. me. Um, they can tell me all they want, you know, no, that's probably not going to be statistically possible. And it's like, well, sorry, I don't believe that. <laughs> then don't give me those numbers. No, you know, don't give me those numbers. I don't want to hear those numbers. I would rather yeah, just focus on yeah. what, what I can be hopeful on. Um, one of the things I've done is, and I have written, I have a chalkboard next to my coffee maker and, um, I have it written on the mirror of my dresser, the mirror in the bathroom. And I have this just beat the odds and because the odds for me have not been good from the diagnosis of my eye. And so that's always been in the back of my mind. But once I was diagnosed with METS, I literally start writing it down everywhere. And yeah, it uh, wasn't just a passing thought to dwell on. It was like, no, I need this every day. Right, exactly. And when people come up and they'll talk to me and they're like, you're a fighter, you're strong, you're this. I immediately want to be like, you know what? I'm not always strong. I'm not always a fighter. It, you know, it's kind of those cliche things. And for me, it's like, I'm in a battle. I'm, I'm having to beat an odd that's against me. And I have to do whatever I can to beat that odd. And, you know, I eat well. I am not as good as I have said in, in the exercise, which I need that I need to incorporate more, but, um, you get outside, you get oxygen Yeah, somewhere. I think it balances out. Exactly. You know, I, I try and I, and I do get good rest. I mean, I, I as a baker, I'm up at four or five every morning. And so by the time I get home at two, I'm ready for bed, you know, but, uh, that's the thing is just find that one mantra. And for me, beat the odds. It's like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And, and I try to stay as strong as possible. Um, I feel like I, there's nothing else I, c- I can do. I can't be looking at doomsday thinking. And, you know, some days well, and it like does feel said, like, like crap. Doomsday, doomsday thinking happens. You still feel it. You still feel the worries and the anxieties. And sometimes they're harder to deal with on a day-to-day basis than others. But like you, you can't live there because you right. can't function there. Right. And that's not, that's not a place that feels good to stay for very long. Right. Um, I think it's an important place to validate and to visit sometimes. And we do, but like just, just realizing that, you know, at the end of the day, you don't have to live there, even if it involves a, you know, heavier dose of denial to get out of it. <laughs> right. I, the thinking I will use, um, also is, a, like when I'm feeling a good feeling, I'm like, you know what? I'm owning this. I'm owning this feeling. So when the bad feelings come in, I'll say, I'll ask myself, is this something you want to own? Is this something you want to hold on to? What can you do to get yourself away from these thoughts? And, you know, and I will typically, you know, talk to a girlfriend or talk to a family member. And, um, I am really blessed with having a family, you know, my son and my daughter and my husband, they, we all talk very openly with one another. And 
So whoever I feel like I need at that moment, I can call them and, and I feel like they'll just turn it around. They'll say something that I need to hear that I, well, and that's such a gift, like to have support, um, from the people that you love the most. And you have to support them. I know this diagnosis is very hard on my husband and I know that he's very concerned, um, with just losing me as a possibility. And so we, we talk about that and not focusing on that and trying to, you know, stay in forward thinking. Yeah. Well, and, and just, just trying to stay in a place where, where you can, you can validate the hard feelings, but you can, like you said, keep moving, keep moving forward Yeah. and keep, keep living with the idea that, okay, tomorrow you're going to be here and just like take it a day at a time if needed. Correct. Um, yep. That's just... well, it's, I mean, it's, it's such a hard thing. Um, and I know it's really not, a, it's not an easy thing to talk about. I think sometimes we think about it a lot and it's like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, like I could talk about that. But I think physically like putting words to it sometimes can feel so difficult and right. so just, I mean, just so heavy. So, I mean, I just want to commend you for, for holding space um, with us for that and for, I guess, really just being courageous enough to talk about this when it's so fresh. Um, Thank you. And uh, I really do, I really do believe that like we do help each other by sharing and talking. Um, Absolutely. I think vulnerability vulnerability creates connection. And so I really hope that someone else who maybe is in a similar situation can listen, can listen in and just glean some, glean some relatability or some hope or just, just connect um, a little better with your story. So thank you again for, for being willing to share and talk. You're about welcome. This. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in person in just a few weeks. Yes. It's going to be so fun. Yes. I hope a lot of people come. I, w- I would really love to meet so many people. And sorry, I'm a hugger, so you're all getting hugs. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a hugger too, so it's okay. Okay. Um, Well, Kat, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording, but thank you again for like coming and being with us. Um, And I look forward to hearing how things are going uh, just, just with your, your treatment and your scans and everything. Thank you. I appreciate it, Danae. All right. Wonderful.